Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, we are continuing our sermon series, Peace Come For You. And it wasn't that long ago, just a couple of weeks ago, we had the opportunity to go through Holy Week. We heard about Jesus meeting in the upper room with his disciples. We heard about the teaching and the prayer and the the Passover meal that Jesus transforms into what you and I know to be the Lord's Supper. We heard about his uh, walk to the Mount of Olives, his arrest, the disciples' desertion, his sham trial, his crucifixion and death on the cross. But then Sunday. And Easter Sunday, it changes everything, doesn't it? God has come for you. He comes back from the dead, giving us hope and life and salvation. His sacrifice on the cross, it tells us that it was accepted by God. Our sins, they have been forgiven. All because of what Jesus has done for you and me. And we have been made a part of God's family. Jesus rises from the dead to assure us, to let us know that peace between God and man, it has been accomplished. Today we are picking up with the story of Easter Sunday. The women had gone to the tomb early in the morning and they returned all out of breath with this incredible story about a missing body and and the vision of angels and the fact that they saw and got to actually speak with Jesus. Peter and John don't believe it and so they go running to the tomb to see for themselves and they return with their report. And no one knows really what to think, right? In fact, what would you think? Our gospel reading picks up with two disciples heading off to a village called Emmaus. Emmaus was just a a small town about seven miles from Jerusalem. It was most likely where these disciples lived, and as they went, they're talking about all that has happened uh, over the last few days. And as I was preparing this and I read that, it it made me kind of wonder, I wonder what you all talk about when you leave church on a Sunday morning, right? What do you talk, do you talk about the things that happened here on a Sunday morning? Uh, Do you talk with kids or grandkids? Hey, what did you learn in Sunday school this morning? Do you talk about the sermon? I didn't get it, did you? (laughs) What was his point anyway? Or maybe you say to yourself, you know, what did you think of that closing song? Or don't you talk about the things that have happened? You're already off onto whatever is coming this afternoon or maybe later this week. You know, the disciples, they were walking and talking together and Jesus, he suddenly drew near to them and he went with them. And yet the disciples, their eyes were kept for recognizing him. And he says to them, you know, what is this conversation that you are holding as you walk with each other? Today I brought with me a picture of one of my favorite paintings because it goes along with our gospel reading for today. Uh, The painting is called Gangnak Emmaus, uh, The Road to Emmaus. It is by 19th century Swiss artist by the name of Robert Zund. And I love this painting because it really just kind of, it activates the imagination, right? I I don't know about you, but I kind of want to zoom in, right? I almost want to just go with them and walk down that road and hear how the conversation went and, and be a part of it. And we may not know exactly how it went, but Luke does give us some idea of how things went. We know that their eyes were kept from recognizing Jesus. Luke identifies one of those two disciples as Cleopas, which means that Cleopas was someone to whom Luke was writing that they would have recognized him, right? Perhaps he was an influential person in Emmaus. Perhaps he was a, a man of notoriety. Perhaps he was a religious leader who had been changed by Jesus and his message. No matter who he is or what he did, Cleopas would have been someone who would have been easily identified and recognized by the readers of Luke's gospel. Cleopas, he asked the stranger who has now joined him and the other disciple on their journey, he says, are you the only one, only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? And you and I, we, we know that it's Jesus, right? Luke tells us it's Jesus. The readers of his gospel, they know it's Jesus, but when you first read it, you can't help but say, really? 
You're asking Jesus, do you know what happened in Jerusalem the last couple of days? Right? It makes you almost want to put your head in your hands. Can't believe it. It's almost hard to read with a straight face. And yet Jesus says to them, what things? He's going to make them recite the story again. And they do. And what they say is a good confession of the fact of the faith, excuse me. It's a good confession of faith. In fact, it contains many of the same essential details that we confess in the second article of the Apostle Creed. They recount the events of Holy Week. They talk about Jesus' humanity, his suffering and death. They talk about the fact that Jesus is crucified at the hands of the religious and civil leaders and even his promise that he would rise again on the third day. They leave out the part about the ascension and the second coming. Those things haven't happened yet. But all in all, it's a very good confession of the faith. But there is one problem. While it may be a good confession of the faith, it's not their faith. You see, mingled in their confession of the faith is a nasty little word. The word in Greek is elpizomen, meaning we had hoped. We had hoped that Jesus was the one to redeem Israel. We had hope that he had come to save his people. We had hope. It's in the past tense. It means the hope that they once had, it is no longer present. It is gone. Now they too, they could have confessed the Apostles' Creed, except for the little phrase at the beginning that makes all the difference, I believe. You see, they could not say, I believe, because things didn't go as they had expected. Their faith, it had been based on a set of criteria that sadly Jesus didn't live up to. Yes, for a while, things look promising. He's a mighty man of deeds. He does all sorts of miracles. He speaks with authority on God's word. He stood up for the everyday common man. But then... Then our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. And then they add on that little detail about the body not being where it should be and the women's strange report from earlier that morning. And it's sad. In fact, it's disappointing, right? We had hoped he would be the one to redeem Israel. In fact, this may be one of the deepest and darkest, most depressing verses in all of the Bible. And it almost begs the question, right? You can almost hear the disciples asking Jesus as they walk with him, where are we to go from here? What are we going to do? Who are we going to follow? Who is going to lead us? And they are in despair. You know, there's lots of people whose confession of faith is like the one of those two disciples. They may know all the facts. They may know all about the Bible. They may have all the information, but it's not their faith, or at least not anymore. You see, there was a time, too, when they had hope that Jesus would be the one to redeem them, but then something happens in their lives. And Jesus no longer lines up with their expectation. Jesus no longer meets their criteria. They thought that life should go one way, and now, like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they say, I too had hoped. And I think these two men and their confession of faith is pretty typical of us all. You know, sometimes our faith is, on this journey is strong, that we're, we're filled with all sorts of hope. We can say with the psalmist in Psalm 46, although the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved in the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, the Lord of hosts is with it. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Our faith is rock solid. And then there are other times where we have doubts and our faith can be dry and nearly life. In fact, there are times where we're not sure of anything and we swear that the prophet was talking about us when Ezekiel says, 
in chapter 37, behold, they say our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we are indeed cut off. And isn't that what happens? Isn't that what happens when we go through something in life and we are kept from seeing Jesus? Our faces are kept from recognizing him. Isn't it what happens when we feel like God is, is far away, that he's, he's far off and he's not listening and he doesn't really care what it is we're going through in life and here we are in despair and struggle and misery. And we feel like we're on life's journey all alone and we fail to see Jesus who is walking with us every step of the way. You know, the good news here is that Jesus comes to them even in the midst of their hopelessness. He doesn't wait around for them to, to come around. He doesn't wait for them to rediscover their faith. We read that Jesus himself drew near and he goes with them. And after having them repeat the details of the faith, he now explains everything to them. Jesus said, O oh, foolish ones and slow to heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, in other words, Jesus goes to the Old Testament and he shows these disciples how it all points to him. It's about his incarnation, his suffering and death, his crucifixion and resurrection from the dead. And we can only guess at the things that Jesus may have pointed them to. You know, maybe, maybe Jesus took them and, and, and reminded them of what happened in the Garden of Eden. How God put Adam to sleep and, and opened his side and took a rib from him. And from that rib, he made for him a bride. And what a scar that must have left on Adam's side. Did it remind them of the scar that Jesus now bears as a spear had been thrust into his side? Maybe Jesus reminds them of how Isaac carried the wood on which he was to be sacrificed by his own father. Maybe Jesus reminds them of how Joseph was sold into slavery by his own brothers and then forgave them because it was God's will. Maybe Jesus reminds them how Israel sacrificed the Passover lamb, a male that was without spot or blemish and its blood causes death to pass over them. Maybe Jesus reminded them of how David prayed in distress. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A company of evildoers encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Maybe Jesus reminded them of the words of Isaiah who said, Surely he shall bore our griefs and carry our sorrows. He was esteemed, yet we esteemed him, stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Yet he was wounded for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Who really knows where Jesus pointed them to in the scriptures? But as Jesus walks with them and talks with them, as he, he teaches them, suddenly their hearts begin to burn within them. You see, the Bible, from, from cover to cover, the scripture, it's all about Jesus and the redemption that he has won for us by his suffering, death, and resurrection. The things that they had witnessed just days ago and were now a part of. And Jesus promised his disciples that he would rise again on the third day. And it's because things happen exactly as they did that you and I, that we can have hope Jesus is what the Bible is all about. Jesus is God's plan to redeem the world. And in fact, Peter would later go on to confess at Pentecost that Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and the foreknowledge of God. This was the way that God would redeem you and me. And so as they drew near to the village that they were going to, Jesus then acts as if he is going to go on a little further. And suddenly these disciples, they begin to urge him, right? Come, stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. And burning hearts that are longing for a reason to hope, they respond to Jesus. 
You can almost hear them, right? Please don't leave us. Please don't go. Not when we're just starting to feel alive again after everything that has happened. Come, stay with us. And once they are there in the house, suddenly the guest becomes the host. When Jesus is at table with them, he takes the bread and blesses it and breaks it and gives it to them. You know, earlier we had said that their eyes were closed. They were kept from seeing Jesus. And to really understand what that all means, we have to go back to the very beginning. In the beginning, Adam and Eve, they sat down to a a different meal, and this time it was a meal in the Garden of Eden. And the serpent had offered them food to eat, and he promised them that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open. But when they ate of it, instead of their eyes being opened, they became blind. They were kept from recognizing the presence of God. The God who they had walked and talked with in the garden, they would no longer feel his presence. They would not see him as they had seen him before, and in not seeing him, all their hope is lost. And they question, can we really trust in this God? Can we put our hope and trust in the one who has created us? But now Jesus of Nazareth, he's redeeming all of his Adam and Eve's just as God had promised. And he opens their eyes in a meal that counteracts the meal the serpent had fed Adam and Eve. And their eyes are opened and they recognize him and in seeing him in the meal, they are once again filled with great hope. You See, it's here in this Emmaus encounter with his blind and hopeless disciples that Jesus reestablishes for his New Testament people the same pattern he had given to them in the Old Testament. He instructs them with his word. We heard God's word read for us earlier. And then he opens our eyes in the supper. He gives us himself, his very body and blood shed for you and me. And it's here as we gather around his table that our eyes are open too doesn't mean that we see him in all of his glory as we will when we are in heaven. It doesn't mean that we see how and why everything is working together for good of those who love God. It doesn't mean that we understand every pain and suffering, trial, circumstance. It doesn't mean that we will never have despair. It doesn't mean that we have all the answers. What it does mean is that in eating of his body and blood, our eyes are opened and we recognize that Jesus is with us through it all. We recognize Jesus is the one who conquered sin, death, and the devil, that he goes with us, that he is walking beside us on this journey of life. Our hope is restored, our faith is strengthened, our sins are forgiven. We have hope. You know, suddenly, Jesus vanishes from before their eyes. And the disciples, they start talking to one another. They say to each other, did not our hearts burn within us when he talked to us while we were on the road, while he opened the scriptures to us? And they arose that same hour and returned back to Jerusalem. You know, as much as I wanted to walk with Jesus and his disciples in that photograph on the way to the road to Emmaus, I'd like to also be with the disciples as they head back to Jerusalem. What a different conversation they must have had than the one they had a few hours ago. Their lives had been changed. And our lives are changed as well. Our lives are changed because we know that Jesus has risen from the dead. He has come to us. He comes to give us hope to strengthen our faith in him, to forgive our sins, to lead us through all of life, to lead us to his perfect kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.